Making It Grow is brought to you in part by Santee Cooper, South Carolina's state-owned electric and water utility. More information on green power and energy conservation programs online at SanteeCooper.com. The South Carolina Department of Agriculture, reminding you that certified South Carolina agricultural products help make South Carolina grow. McLeod Farms in Macby, South Carolina. This family farm offers seasonal produce, including over 22 varieties of peaches. Glory Foods, celebrating Southern food with a soulful heritage. Glory Foods, a way of inviting South Carolina back to the dinner table. FTC Diversified, a proud part of your local communities, providing communication, entertainment, and security. Art Fields, a 10-day art competition in Lake City, South Carolina. Additional funding provided by International Paper. Mother Nature is giving a nod to old folk wisdom, and she's got people who planted their gardens before Easter a little bit nervous tonight. We'll have to wake up in the morning and see what really happened. But one thing we know right now is that we're so glad you can join us for SCE TV's own gardening show, Making It Grow, coming to you live from historic downtown Sumter. It's a great time of year, and we're so glad that you're with us. And Teresa Young is in the chat room, and she'd like some company tonight. So. When we go inside, she's going to tell you how easy it is to join her there. And if you haven't done it before, we hope that you will go on ahead and become a chatter tonight. You know, we go wonderful places around the great state of South Carolina, and we had a grand visit at Middleton Place learning about the artisans and craftsmen. And tonight we're going to see what the potter used to do in historical olden times. And we also are really excited tonight. The weather may be a little bit chilly, but that doesn't mean we don't enjoy a homemade treat. And we have um, our insect specialist has got on her chef's apron, Vicki Burtonolly, and she's born joined by Lori Aker from Earth Fair, and they're going to make a wonderful dessert for us. Ooh, just can't wait. And talking about not being able to wait, Dr. John Nelson decided to ride over to Sumter, and he's sitting here with Tony Melton, and we're going to answer your questions. How about that? What a lot's going on. So let's go inside and get started. Mr. Teresa Young, who is our water quality expert, who so sweetly drives over from Florence. And um, I think y'all have got some new programs going that, um, make it easier to keep yard and keep water cleaner. You are correct, Amanda. We have the Carolina Yards program, and the idea is that you garden with South Carolina's environment in mind. That sets yourself up for success, so better plant success with less maintenance. I know that makes me happy. If you'd like more information or perhaps you want to join our online course, you can just do an internet search for Carolina Yards. should be the first thing that pops up, or if you have a great memory, the URL is clemson.edu slash cy for Carolina Yards. And speaking of websites, have you been to the Making It Grow website lately? www.mig.org and you can see that we are now streaming live so you can watch Making It Grow from any internet device if you can't watch from the comfort of your television set. The Facebook page is accessible here as well and down at the bottom of the screen you'll see that you have links to shorts and even web exclusives that you can see sometimes before we play them on TV. And speaking Speaking of the Facebook page, I hope you'll go there and consider joining us in the chat room. Click on the green Let's Talk icon. You'll be prompted to log in to join in the discussion. We already have six speakers and six viewers this evening, and I hope to see a lot more chatting with us very soon. Amanda, back to you. Thank you so much, Teresa. And we are so excited because I don't have to use electronic transfer vision to um, talk to my old friend and professor from the University of South Carolina, Dr. John Nelson. He's sitting right here beside me. And John, of course, is the <coughs> director of the A. Seymour Herbarium, which is a, one of the finest herbariums, herbaria, one of the finest herbaria in the country. And, um, and he's a wonderful botanist. And we are so pleased that you joined us. But John, you've always told us that you had a brown thumb. So I figure you're going to help people 
by telling them what they shouldn't do, maybe. Well, who knows what's <laughs> going to happen tonight, Amanda. But, um, yeah, it's kind of fun for a taxonomist <laughs> to be on the panel, although I kind of do think that if there are important questions that have to be answered, I might defer to my colleague here, Tony. Well, I think that you do have um, fun things you're going to share with us tonight, just like you do when it's the mystery plant. And it's great fun having you here in person. And we're going to have them in a little while. That's right. And of course, oh, it's time for those fall <laughs> vegetable gardens. I mean, those summer vegetable gardens. I said fall because it's a little bit chilly tonight, Tony. But Tony Melton, of course, is a specialist who helps people with small fruits and vegetables all over the place. And um, Tony, you told me that actually you've been a little concerned about some things. What have you been helping at the farmers with lately? Well, especially wind. Mm -hmm. Wind is really tough People on People don't basement. think about that though, Tony. Mm -hmm. Why is it so bad for plants? It, it, it just breaks them, really. I mean, it's, it, they're out there setting into a garden all alone and the wind blowing. And These it little transplants back, and things. goes back yeah. and forth and they break. Uh, that's why I always like to plant a tomato deeper. Oh. Because then you don't have to, uh, then you don't have to worry about it being blown as much. It has more support. Okay, man. yeah. And Tony, we usually don't plant things more deeply, but a tomato has the ability to to do what with the on the stem. It can do what. It produces roots all the way up the stem. So you can, I've even dug a trench and laid them down and stuck them <laughs> up with the tips, just as long as you don't cover up the growing the point growing up tip. in the top. Uh, you're fine, and you can bury them deeper, and they'll root all the way up them. That's and just actually, tomatoes. Um, making it kind of horizontal, um, you've, that may be where your better soil is. That's right, right yeah. up towards the surface. Okay. You got your top soil. Yeah. There. All right. Thank you so much. Oh, and we are going to have such a wonderful time with the side counter because we've got our entomologist wearing a different hat tonight, Vicki Burton Ollie, and she's got a great partner with her, Lori Aker from Earth Fair. What you gals got planned? Um, thanks, Amanda. Well, tonight. I'm making some ice cream, but I'm telling you, there's no insects in it. So um, we're having um, a family recipe. I'm going to make some strawberry ice cream. And then Lori Aker from Earth Fair in mm -hmm. Columbia, you're going to help make a topping. Yes, not only are we going to show folks how to make an all-natural strawberry ice cream, we're also going to show how to put together a quick and easy summer fruit salsa, which is really the perfect addition to any ice cream sundae. It gives the traditional sundae a little bit of a healthier twist, if you will. Oh, so wonderful. Tons of good stuff coming up. Exciting. Yes. I can't wait. <laughs> um, so I think, Amanda, we're going to come. We're, you're going to see us a little bit later, and, um, and I'm so excited to share with you guys. Um, but we'll see you guys in a minute. And we all have our spoons stashed away over here so we can run over there and be with you at the end of the show. But we've got a caller right now. After all, that's what we're here for. And Ellen is calling us from Walterboro. Oh, we do love Walterboro. Ellen, how are things down there? And um, what can we do for you tonight? Hello, Amanda. Hey, how are you? I'm fine, and I just love your show. I, I can't miss it. Well, we thank you, and we we would miss y'all if we weren't with you. Well, I got gardenias. I've already cut one down because nothing I've done to them, it didn't help. But the leaves are real black. Yep, that happens with those gardenias. And um, let's see, um, Tony, that is a real problem and you just some, sometimes you have to do something about it. What would you recommend? Yeah. What's well, causing it? Well, Amanda, white flies love gardenias as much as I do. Yeah, I uh, love to sniff those beautiful flowers. Oh, They're very, very fragrant, just wonderful. But white flies love to feed on them, and you can actually touch the bush in the summertime, and they just fly all over like flower flying mm -hmm. off. Uh, so she needs to control the white flies, which is really the white fly. Uh, it's, it's excrements from the white fly fall down on a leaf, sooty mold grows on it, which is the black stuff, mm -hmm. and it shuts the light out of the leaf, and then a lot of times the leaves fall off the plant because it, it, the plant uh -huh. thinks it's a freeloader because it's, it's not producing any kind of sugars or anything. So what do you recommend? Give us a couple of options, um, maybe a mechanical or cultural one, and then maybe um, one that would involve maybe a, a light pesticide. Well, uh, I'd probably use uh, you know some sectocidal soap first mm -hmm. of all, that. Yeah. but you've got to do it at least three to four times in a row because you're only going to kill adults, 
and you're not going to kill the immatures and the larvae and all that type of stuff. And on how that. far, how, wait, how many days do you wait between applications, Tony? Uh, well, about one week if okay. it's warm. Okay. If it's all cool, right. it would probably you know, be a little bit And I think it. that rather than spraying from the top, you need to get under and kind um, of spray. Is that correct? That's the under the leaves. That's the where leaves, they are. Yeah. That's a nice tender place for them to feed up under the leaves. Okay. Thank you so very, very much. And um, we've got a caller from Oswego, and we are so happy that Billy's given us a call tonight. How can we help you? Amanda, I have a problem with fairy moss rain, I believe it is, in mm -hmm. centipede. Uh -huh. And I want to know what I can do to get rid of it. And I'll hang up. Now, and this is, before we hang up, this is a fairy, is it the little mushrooms that come up? I, I never see a mushroom, and everything I read, they always say you have mushrooms. Uh -huh. what do you, so but what I never does it see a like? mushroom. It's a ramp, it's a circle, uh -huh. and the centipede will die, but uh, I never see the mushroom, and I, I can't, un I don't understand, you know, what it okay. is, but I want to try to see if I can get now, rid of it. are these large areas, are they dead in the middle also, or is it just a ring? Yes, they're dead in the middle, okay. and it goes out in a circle. Okay, all right. Um, Tony, it may be another problem rather than a fairy ring. What, what do you think is going on well, here? Well, sometimes you can have fairy rings without mushrooms. Mm -hmm. There are some of them that do that that you don't see. Uh, but most of the time they do have mushrooms and fairy rings. And, it get, and a fairy ring stays in one place and gets bigger and bigger and bigger every year because the, actually the mushroom fungus grows out and gets bigger and bigger. Uh, it may be large patch, though, is what I'm thinking. They just changed the name of brown patch not too long ago to large patch, which just confused me, I think, man. But it is a fungal disease. Um, actually, it's more of a, it's a water mold. Mm -hmm. Everybody, we always call it a fungal, but it's a water mold that actually grows on the grass and causes it to die. Tony, a lot of times when people aren't sure of what they have, I tell them to take a sample about the size of their hand that has the healthy turf and the unhealthy turf and bring it to the local extension office to be sent off to the mm -hmm. plant problem clinic where they can make those identifications and give recommendations. Would you think this would be something this gentleman might want to consider? Very much so and, and definitely get some healthy and some that's, okay. that's under disease. And John, if it were mushrooms, the mushroom, people think that's the whole thing, but give us a little quick review of mushrooms. The thing that pops up is not the majority of the organism, is it? Not at all. In fact, um, the mushrooms that we usually see in our yards are just, it's like the tip of, the, tip of an iceberg. The tip of an iceberg. And wow. so the, the fungus is uh, growing below the ground and with a huge, huge amount of um, living cells. Mm -hmm. And we just barely see this little structure that's actually producing the spores. So, so it, they pop up when they're healthy and ready right. to and make some And of course they babies. don't last very long. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in my yard, we of course have uh, little rings where the grass is dark green and is dead in the middle. But I think that's because we have the dogs, dogs are running around. <laughs> yeah. yeah, female dog causes that very much so. They sure can. But, um, but we love our dogs. And uh, Mary is down in Charleston. And Mary, do you have a dog or do you have a problem with your, with your lawn or your garden? Hey, Barry. Yes, I had a question for Tony uh, about cucumbers. Okay. What's your um, question? Tony, I... I had planted um, some for my seed. I had planted some uh, Kirby cukes, and they have uh, they have grown and they grew last year. And uh, and what happened was about when the, they were starting to fruit, and uh, they would fruit, and um, th there would be about five cucumbers on each plant. And then all of a sudden, then I'd see the big leaves start turning yellow, and then another one turn yellow, and then they would just start getting spongy, kind of like in, in, in like like sponge sacks everywhere and, and it stopped flowering and then the stem itself just kind of went to nothing. Oh. I was wondering is that a, is that kind of a beetle or, and, it, and I kept doing it a few times. I didn't buy I didn't buy them in a cup or nothing from you know from from the home centers or nothing. I, I did them all from seed and uh, I was just wondering have you ever heard of that and it, it happened like six different times. Oh we're right. so sorry but Tony I, I think we I think it does happen doesn't it? Yes ma'am it, it does. does. Yeah. Yeah, uh, cucumbers, any of the cucurbit family, have some diseases that, uh, that attack them. And the best thing you can do with cucurbits is plant them early. 
plant them as soon as you think this cold temperature is over, we'd plant them and get them off before July, because after July, a disease that we call downy mildew mm -hmm. comes in, and it's resistant to about all chemicals mm -hmm. that we have, except for some that we use on a commercial basis. What I would suggest uh, is an older product, Dicanil. You can start out spraying with that in early spring if you need to. Usually in early spring, you don't have to do much spraying. Mm -hmm. So I like to plant early and not have to do anything mm -hmm. much. And I want to tell him one thing, and that's to move things around. Don't put his cucumbers back Same where he had cucumbers okay. before or right. cantaloupes or anything in that cucurbit family. Don't put it back there because the, the same disease will be there again. Tony, since the downy mildew can't be controlled with dacanil or the other fungicides that are available to homeowners, how do we tell the difference between, how do we diagnose the downy mildew rather than sit out there and try to apply a fungicide when it's not going to do us any good? Well, downy mildew usually gets here in July. So if okay. you can get that crop to grow before July, you're okay, Okay. usually. So really, just try to get it in the ground as soon as possible. That's right. So he may want to go ahead and get some transplants and get a head start. You don't think that you wouldn't worry about his bringing the disease in on the transplants necessarily? Uh, you can possibly do that, uh -huh. yeah, depending on where you get your transplants. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, okay. and, and seed is just about as quick okay. as transplants in All the right. cucurbits, because they, when you move, when you take them out of a pot, you damage the roots, and they don't like that at so, all. So with a cucurbit, you do well just to go with seed. Yep. Okay, you John, you have something that <clears throat> kind of looks like a cucumber back there, but I don't think it's a cucumber. Let's bring that thing up here and talk about it. Okay, um, Amanda, we have a very... I don't want to drop it. A mysterious thing that we're going to um, examine very closely. And it, you see it's very it's, solid. It has it's a very solid. It is a fruit uh -huh. and it has a, the flower end is here. And of course the stem end is okay, on the other end. This was where the, the flower was. Right. This was the stem. Okay. And um, this is a, a big old thing. I was, I th came from the market and what I thought we'd do was open her up and see what it looks like on the inside. Okay. Oh. Might be very exciting to see. I got my Swiss Army knife. We here. don't want it too much excitement. Don't cut your finger. I'm going to try okay. not to do that. And Just the right amount of excitement. And the reason I wanted to bring this along was because of, I expect some of the yeah, viewers. <laughs> here, let me help. Go ahead. Yeah. Just don't cut me. <laughs> so watch out, everybody. I expect some of the viewers haven't seen this thing and uh, maybe haven't much experience with it. And I just want to show you what oh, a wonderful, beautiful. wonderful <gasps> fruit this is. And what is it? Well, it's a papaya. Papaya. And these things are easy to grow. Not only are they easy to grow, they're wonderful to eat. Gosh, and, it's beautiful. And um, I don't think this one is absolutely ripe, but it sure is soft. Oh, it's soft Look on the inside. And I bet uh -huh. we could taste it if you wanted to. And it's okay. got plenty of little black seeds. Mm -hmm. And let's see if somebody wants to... Um, sure, I'll give it a try. Yeah. Tony, you want to try Taste that. Tony, I'll cut some for you. Uh, I hope it's I good. I can't believe it's right because it was so hard on the it outside. It was hard. It was um, pretty solid. Tony, help yourself. Thank you. I, it's very good, but it's not as good as a watermelon. <laughs> <laughs> but it's delicious. And uh, of but course, but this is a tropical fruit, isn't it? It is a tropical fruit. I better not try it, but because um, I'm speaking. Oh. But um, I I, maybe there was some. Well, I'll try it. No, I'll try it. <laughs> and aren't the little berries pretty? The I little seeds. The little yeah. See, the whole thing is a berry. The whole thing is a berry. Okay. It's a fruit. And there's plenty okay. of seeds. Of course, I've been haranguing my students about that. I'm sure that you have. So yeah. long okay. now. Okay. But these are pretty easy to grow. If you get one of these at the market. Make sure oh, it's right. Oh, okay. You can grow these. They're uh -huh. quite easy to. But you'd to have sprout. to bring it inside in the in the. If winter. you want it to uh -huh. stay, you know, any amount of time, you'd have to bring it inside. And okay. uh, they had some fantastic examples of this plant growing in the um, Darlamore's um, <gasps> gardens. They? Oh yeah, and they grow them in the greenhouse during the winter and bring them out and put them all summer long. They get to be ten feet tall. Well, and you know, it's not going to be long before you and I and John and Vicky and Teresa and others will be down there in Lake City because we're all trekking down there for April the 26th. We're going to have a live audience show at the Bean Market. And um, you and 
you and Vicki are going to be the plant people, the, the mysterious plant people. Tony's <laughs> going to do vegetables, and we're going to have a fabulous time. And we hope that all of you will come to Lake City on April the 26th and join us. And Teresa has got all that information on our Facebook page. And, of course, Art Fields will be going on, and it is an extravaganza, and you will have the best time you've ever had in your life seeing all kinds of art from the southeast. So you'll be able to relate to it all because it's all from the southeast, right? <laughs> I'm looking forward okay. to it. Okay. All righty. Um, and Miss Teresa, um, I know you're going to be with us down there, and we are looking forward to having you with us for that exciting event, aren't we? I sure am looking forward to it, and I hope that we'll have a large crowd. What an opportunity to be part of the Making It Grow family live and in person and see a wonderful art venue all at the same time. Make it a day. Um, you know, Come explore Lake City, see what's uh, in store there, check out all the wonderful art, have a bite to eat, and then join us for the show. We're having a great conversation in the chat room, about 25 people in there. I know lots of folks are excited to have Tony on the panel. We had a question about what his comments were in terms of the white fly control on the gardenias. And a lot of the information you can find on Clemson's Home and Garden Information Center website. That's clemson.edu slash hgic. Once you're there, you can either look through various topics or you can just type in the search bar. So I can type in gardenia pests and then I see that the search brings up HGIC fact sheet 2059 and sure enough, I can see white flies and control recommendations which include insecticidal soap or horticultural oil sprays which I believe is exactly what Tony said. Amanda back to you. Thank you so much um, and we have another caller from Bennettsville. Nathan is on the line. Nathan how can we help you tonight? Yes ma'am my question is what can I use to get rid of, of moss in your yard? And do you have a lot of shade in your yard, Nathan? Well, it's around shade. It's around, the moss is near where it's shady? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, oh, well, you know, a lot of people like to have moss yards, and um, mosses are beautiful, but then we have people who like that fancy turf grass. Tony, what would you recommend? Well, the first thing I would do is try to limb up the trees a little bit or something to get some more light in there mm -hmm. so to it give the turf a little bit more of an advantage. I mean, and help it dry out a little bit more because when it's moist, you know, John will tell us it's, it's, it's more moisture, the more moss is going to love it. So uh, they're going to really grow well up under there. So kind of dry it out, get some more wind drainage in there. And and then there's, uh, there, St. Augustine grows some in shade, mm -hmm. but most of our grasses, uh, soldier has some varieties that have uh, resistant shade. But none of them really do great in shade. I like mulch under shade. Mm -hmm. I, I think I can grow mulch real well up yeah, under. John yeah. can even grow mulch, <laughs> mulch. Real, real well up under shade. Tony, <laughs> do you ever need to um, loosen the soil? Is that one of the things that can it, can it, lead to moss? And I mean, sometimes people maybe will have some traffic in the yard or something, and the soil gets kind of compacted. Mm -hmm. um, how would you? Because it holds more. How would you when check? It gets yeah, how would you check for that? I just try to, I just usually just take a trial and try to stick it in the ground. If you can't stick it straight down into the ground, it's too hard. It's it could be hard as my head. <laughs> <laughs> and then are there things you can do if you have compacted soil? That's it. You can, you know, uh, gypsum helps with uh -huh. compacted soil, okay. kind of softens it That's up a little bit. Or could, either yeah. till it some or aerate it. Aerate it, okay. Would help. Uh, and then if you really wanted to, maybe some copper sulfate is one of the things that can be used to help control the moss. Mm -hmm. What it does is it, it kills uh, mosses and that. But if you don't change the cultural conditions and the moss is still happy, I think it'll just come like that. I think so. Yeah. It really uh, requires a lot of water or considerable amount of water for reproduction. So, um, and If I we got a dry summer. Yeah, take it, care it, it. it might take care of the, yeah. okay. it might take care of them off that All right. Um, Judy's calling us now, and she is up in North Carolina, our first caller from North Carolina tonight. Judy, we're always glad to hear from you people up there. What's happening in your part of the world that we can help you with? Yes, Amanda, I sure do enjoy your program. Well, we thank Last you. Last year, my apple tree produced a lot of apples, except the worms enjoyed them more than I did. Oh. Uh -huh. uh, I really had a time with with worms and just uh, want something very safe to uh, 
take care of that. Judy, Do you have is any the, suggestions? Is, is this a regular sized tree or is it one of those little dwarf trees? It's somewhere in between. I just moved into the house oh. a couple of years ago, so I really don't know what kind it is. Okay, all right. But it's, um, is it's it over... About, it's probably about 15 feet tall now. It's not been pruned well at all. All right. All right. Well, um, let's see if Tony has any advice for a homeowner with a kind of tall tree. Mm -hmm. What do you think? All you tree fruits are a little bit difficult to grow in South Carolina. Well, most of them, yeah. of course. Some of them are, are, are have a difficulty, and apples happen to be one of them. It, it, uh, especially in the heat down, we have a lot of trouble. Uh, I would just, what I typically recommend from homeowners is to go purchase a home fruit or a home orchard spray, mm -hmm. and uh, that way you've got an insecticide and a fungicide mixed together, and, and do not spray until the flower petals fall because you do not want to hurt those precious bees out That's there true. because they, want, they need to be there for pollination. So after the petals start falling around your yard, then start the spraying and uh, it and tells you- And follow the directions on the label. Yeah, how mm -hmm. long before harvest you got to quit. Uh -huh. You have to wait, okay. Yep. And maybe she'll be able to enjoy a few of the apples and not have them um, all feeding the worm population. Although um, I'm sure the birds then love the worms, so it's kind of a two-way street sometimes. We had one when I was a kid. We didn't pay any attention to it. You didn't care about an apple yeah. worm. It or <laughs> we loved apples. Mary's calling us from Lake City. How about that, Mary? We're so glad to hear from you tonight. We hope that you'll join us on the 26th of April. But, um, but right now, we'll try to help you with your garden question. I have southern stem blight in my garden. Oh. Could you please have your very knowledgeable panel Tell us what to do. Thank um, you. Thank you. Oh, goodness. Tony? Yeah, uh, southern stem blight is a, is a problem on especially on tomatoes and peppers. Which are in the same family, Which in the if same, I'm not yes. family. Uh -huh. yes, and uh, it really becomes a real bad problem. And actually, it can hit watermelons. It can go under Ooh. the bottom of the watermelon and cause the bottom right out. Cantaloupes, too, especially cantaloupes under the bottom. Um, what I would suggest, in, in tomatoes especially, is wrap something around the stem or protect the stem. You can either take a little piece of PVC pipe in a four inch piece uh -huh. and slide it easily down over your little transplant. Don't break the limbs uh -huh. or anything. You have to be easy with it and, or, and, and put it around the stem and then, don't, and then plant it just like here, a little above uh -huh. and a little below. All right. About All right. two inches okay. below, two okay. inches above and uh -huh. protect that stem or you can use aluminum foil about a well, that'd be easy. as big uh -huh. as my yeah. hand. Uh -huh. Wrap it around uh -huh. loosely, loosely and the then stem's don't put any grow. soil back in between the stem and that aluminum foil. Okay. And see, see, southern stem drop below two inches below the ground, it will not germinate and oh. grow. It only grows right at the surface. It's so got if to you get can there. occlude it from that area, you got it made. That's right. Okay. All right. Thank you. That was a that it was nice to hear something that we can actually tell people what, something to do about it. Some and, things we can't. And a cantaloupe, before I forget it, you it's just set it up on something, oh, get okay. it up off the ground. You know, to keep it from attacking the bottom of the cantaloupe. Okay, that's really fun. Just raise it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Oh, goodness gracious. Teresa, I know that you are busy up over there trying to entice those fence sitters to join the conversation, but um, tell me what's happening in the chat room. Well, we are busy, and a lot of the conversation has been about pests in the garden. So I'd like to share something completely opposite, not a pest, but something that goes along with gardening, and that's attracting wildlife. And so I have a picture of a bluebird nest that was submitted to our Facebook page, and you can see six little blue eggs, which is fairly common, although at my house usually have five. And one of our uh, Facebook fans asked about how to keep the snakes away from eating the eggs and eating the babies. And of course, that is a natural part of, of the circle of life, but not exactly probably something you want to happen right in front of your uh, eyes in the backyard. So what you can do is mount your bluebird box on conduit pipe or any smooth scrap pipe, and that will make it a little bit harder for the snakes and other climbing predators to get into the box. You can also purchase or create a baffle to go on that will also keep those snakes from slithering up and having a meal on those babies. Let's check in with Vicki and Lori at the side counter. Thanks, Teresa. Um, tonight, I'm gonna be sharing with you guys one of my 
family's ice cream recipes and mm -hmm. I'm so excited about it. And then you're gonna help dress mm -hmm. the ice cream with? Mm -hmm. Yes, we are giving the traditional ice cream sundae a bit of a healthier twist and we're gonna make some uh, summer fruit salsa. It's packed with nutrients, very colorful, and kids can help in the kitchen as well. So it's a pretty fun recipe. Oh, exciting. Yes. Okay. Now before we get into the salsa, I wanna ask you a little bit about this ice yep. cream. Strawberry happens to be my favorite. Now on the table here, we have some of the ingredients and I noticed, I, I see eggs. Mm -hmm. Eggs, they, they typically aren't a common ingredient in ice cream, so why eggs? Right, there's, there's two types of ice cream. Okay. There's an American style ice cream and then mm -hmm. there's a French style mm, ice cream. Really? Now the American style ice cream doesn't have any eggs in it. Okay. Um, the French style mm -hmm. does. Okay. And what the eggs do is they kind of make it a custardy, give nice. it a custardy texture. Okay. And um, it turns out that it's going to give it a rich, deep Ooh. flavor that is just amazing. Very nice. That's one of my favorite for. things. Yes. <laughs> so it's so it gives it an airy texture, if you will. Yes, it does. Okay, very good. Um, and so for this recipe, what we're going to end up using is four eggs. Um, we're going to beat them a little bit, and you don't have to cook them or anything okay. like that. We we're just beat add them it directly um, into yeah, the mix. We can add them directly into the mix. Okay. Um, we're going to use one can of sweetened condensed milk. Okay. And then we're going to use a cup of sugar. Okay. Um, and just a, a pinch of salt in there because you always add salt to ice sure, cream. Sure, regular it, table yeah, salt. Okay. Regular table salt. Um, just a little bit of vanilla. Um, okay. I use a cap full of vanilla. Okay. Um, and it's it's just to give it um, a little bit more background sure, taste. Sure, absolutely. And then um, whenever you put, um, you've got your, your churn. Okay. We're going to put all of these ingredients in. Okay. And then the strawberries come in. Yes. Um, these are wonderful locally grown strawberries. Um, Mike and Deke Kiesler grew these. Um, they're from James R.C.'s Farms in Gilbert. Nice. And local they, strawberries are always the best. Oh, they're, yes. they're my favorite. They have such a nice, vibrant red color, and they're huge. I haven't seen strawberries these like that in a long wonderful. time. These are wonderful. Great, local so, strawberries. For um, this particular recipe, I like to put about six cups of strawberry okay. um, strawberries into my ice cream mix. Okay. And it's all according to how much strawberry flavoring you want. Sure, um, sure. I like a lot in it, so mm -hmm. I put as much as I can right, in there. Right, a little extra in so, there. Um, are we adding the whole berries in, or do we need to mix that up? Do we need to bring it to a puree? Um, I like to puree mine because okay. whenever you use a whole fruit and you mm -hmm. slice it up, right. um, because everything gets so cold mm -hmm. in the ice cream maker, um, it's going to end up being just frozen fruit. Like you really don't get the taste there. of the fruit. So oh, it's just I see. Like a so, chunk the, of so the puree really fruit. brings out that flavor. It does. And it, it, does it give it that color too? It does. It's going to give it a nice, nice. rich pink color. Oh, okay. it's going to be wonderful. Ooh. Um, and so we're going to combine all this okay. into the ice cream mm -hmm. churn. Okay. Um, put the dasher in, cover it up, mm -hmm. and you'll put ice in it. Okay. Um, I put a couple inches of ice, a little bit of rock salt, a mm -hmm. little bit more ice, a little bit more rock salt. Okay. And you run this thing till it stops. Yeah. And whenever it stops is when it's done. That's the fun time, right? Yeah, that's the best time. <laughs> now, um, I know we're working with strawberry. Can mm -hmm. you use any other fruit like peach, blueberry? Can you play around with the flavors? You can, um, there's it, there's endless, but okay. what I would do is I would puree all of it, because okay. you don't want to just have the chunks in there. Sure. It doesn't taste the same. It's going to taste so much better if it's yep. pureed. Very nice, very yep. nice. And again, it gives it that nice flavor and nice vibrant color. It does, Very absolutely. Good. And so we've got our ice cream here, but it mm -hmm. looks a little plain. Yes, we so need something on top. I think we need some <laughs> salsa to go on top. Yes. So. The great thing about this recipe, it is super simple to make. And again, kids can help in the kitchen. It's packed with nutrients, full of color. Trust me, you're not even going to miss the hot fudge and the sprinkles with these sundaes. You have everything you need right here. So you want to get started? Yes. All right. The first thing you're going to do is take about a cup of diced strawberries. And again, we're working with that with the uh, nice local strawberries out of Gilbert. Okay. Nice vibrant color. And strawberries, not only are they going to give us that nice color, tons of vitamin C and antioxidants. It's going to help give us some of those health benefits. Oh, wonderful. And if you want to go ahead and start stirring, I'm going to add in our second ingredient. Okay. We're going to add in about a cup of kiwi. Now kiwi, obviously a little tart there. Mm -hmm. um, the strawberries and the other ingredients are going to help balance out those flavors. After our kiwi, we're going to add in a little bit of diced mango. Again, a nice punch of color with that yellowish orange. This is one of my very favorite fruits. Yes, it gives it, it's, I love it. It's a nice texture. It's, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's a great taste. It is. It's a great ingredient to add in there. And then to help balance out the sweetness and the tartness of all the other fruits, mm -hmm. we're going to add in about a cup of Granny Smith apples. Now, I do recommend before you add it into your recipe, toss it with a little bit of lemon juice or lime juice. And what does that do? Um, the acidity will actually help uh, keep that nice white creamy color in there for us. So, so it, it doesn't won't turn. turn brown. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. And just a little toss, maybe a, a teaspoon or so. Okay. 
And then finally, we're gonna add in some nice ripe blueberries, about three fourths of a cup. We're gonna add that directly into the mix. Now, once we give this a good stir, mm -hmm. we're gonna add in a couple tablespoons of fresh mint. Oh. I love mint. Okay. Do you have mint yes, at home? Yes, I do. do, you grow I, do that? I do. It is a uh, fabulous ingredient to work with. It's gonna give us a nice little kick. It'll give it a little bite. Yes. yes. And, and again, just maybe a tablespoon or so. Okay. And I would recommend saving a little bit of the mint for later to garnish. Okay. Um, you can take those whole mint leaves and put it right on top of the sundae. Now, oh, next, okay. uh, we're going to add in some freshly squeezed lime juice. Now, this lime juice is going to help get our glaze started for the salsa. Okay. Okay. And we're going to add that directly on top of our fruit there. Now, how much is this? Um, I would add, we're, we're making a larger portion here, but I would stick with about two tablespoons okay. of fresh lime juice. Okay. Now, once we get that juice in there, this is my favorite ingredient. That looks like honey. Yes, local honey out of Cottageville, South Carolina. Oh, this is going to complement everything yes. wonderfully. And not only does it add a nice sweet flavor and gorgeous color, again, it's going to help make that glaze for us. And believe it or not, the acidity in the lime juice is going to help break up that thickness, that consistency of the honey, uh, creating that, that uh, fluid glaze. Now, we have two ingredients left. Okay. Next, we're going to add in a little bit of orange marmalade. About a teaspoon. You could add up to two teaspoons okay. if you'd like. Do we have to use orange or can we use any flavor? Nope, you can use any flavor okay. that you'd like. I okay. like to stick with orange because it has a nice neutral uh, flavor to it, but you can also use pineapple, even a strawberry or blackberry marmalade. Oh, okay. Again, that's going to help with our glaze and look okay. how gorgeous that is. A nice glisten there. Now, um, it looks mm -hmm. like um, there's, <laughs> is this a secret ingredient of yours? Yes, it looks kind of different. <laughs> I like to say there is one ingredient in every recipe that really pulls the flavors together. And although it looks a little bit like garlic, this is actually minced ginger. Now, oh, so We've got mm -hmm. some over here. If you never worked with ginger root before, it looks something like this. And you just uh, break off a little piece and skin it and then chop it into small bits like you see here. Okay. And it adds a little bit of a spicy flavor. A we don't want to add kick. too much of it. Not just... too much, about a teaspoon or maybe okay. even half a teaspoon okay. there. Oh, you um, can smell it. Yes, it's um, very strong aroma. Oh, yes. I love working with ginger and tons of health benefits. They're great for the immune system. Um, but basically, once you get all of your fresh ingredients mixed in a bowl, you're going to pop it in the fridge and let it cool for about two hours or so. And when it comes out, we're going to take our ice cream and we are simply going to pour this right on top of the strawberry ice oh, cream Oh, look how here. pretty that look is. Look how gorgeous that is. And if you want to garnish again with the mint leaves, you can. You can also top it with a little bit of slivered almond to add a bit of a crunch to make it a, a true sundae, if you will. Um, but there you go. That is our summer uh, fruit salsa with our homemade strawberry ice cream. Do you want to dig in? I'm pretty excited about it. <laughs> Let's get started. <laughs> All right. And we're going to try to save some for everyone else, but can't nope. make any promises. They're you ready? They're jealous. Mmm. <laughs> Oh, it's so it's good. wonderful. Just the right amount of sweetness there. We're not going to be able to talk the rest of the segment. We're going to be eating. <laughs> wonderful. Now, we're going to post these recipes mm -hmm. um, a little bit later, mm -hmm. and we'll be able to get this information later on in the show. Yep. We're going to tell you how to find the complete recipe with step-by-step -step instructions. So hang tight. We're going to give that at the end of the show. Yep. And um, hope you enjoy. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> um, I'm excited to share this with everybody. You so. taste that ginger, don't you? Oh, yes, yep. I do. <laughs> All right. Um, and now we're going to check in with Teresa in the chat room. Teresa? Thanks very much. That looks absolutely delicious, and I'm a little jealous that I have to sit here, and I can't wander on over, and I'll have to wait to the show, end of the show to try it. Not only is it strawberry season, but it's the season that we see beautiful dogwood blooms all over the landscape and uh, I have a photo that was shared uh, with the pink variety and not only does it provide beauty in the landscape but several species of butterflies utilize dogwoods as a host plant. That's the plant that the caterpillars feed on. They provide nectar for bees and other pollinating insects, places for birds to build their nest and the fruit that's produced later on in the season is eaten by upwards of 35 species of birds according to Birds and Blooms magazine. So perhaps you'll consider are adding this beautiful native to your landscape, but remember to choose the right plant for the right place. Dogwoods don't like to be out in the full sun. You can find out more by using the Carolina Yards plant database. I'll be sure to post the link on our Facebook page. Amanda, back to you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, and the dogwoods are so beautiful this time of year. And we've got a North Carolina call, and now Georgia is um, getting in the game too, Tony. And Charles is calling us from Guyton, Georgia. Hey, Charles, how are you tonight? And what's happening in your part of the world? Oh, I'm doing good. Um, good. I'm an organic grower and about eight years ago, 
I started a bunch of citrus plants from seed, and I can't figure out how to get them to bloom. <laughs> well, were they, um, what, what was it, an orange or a lemon or a lime, or what was it? What were they? Uh, pink grapefruit. Pink grapefruit. Oh, goodness, and about eight years old, and he started from seed, which means he doesn't really know if it's a good producer or if they're going to be sweet or much about them, because when you deal with seeds, John, I think you get a lot of variation. All right, there's all sorts of genetics going on, especially with uh, citrus really? and uh, oh, sure. Particularly. And so uh, we don't really know what's going on with their, the genetics of the, um, the, and within the ovules and the pollen that are being fertilized. Goodness. Well, something went on because we got some seeds and we got some plants, but they're not doing anything, Tony, at least not doing what he wants them to. Is it too young or is it just hard to make it happen? Most likely too young. Okay. It takes a while for them to get mature. See, when most people uh, produce a citrus, like our friend Stan sure, McKenzie. Stan McKenzie. Yeah. Boy, boy, can he produce some citrus. What yeah. he does is he takes and and has a rootstock mm -hmm. of a trifoliate orange is really what he does. A very and vigorous rootstock. Grows it up and then he cuts it and puts a scion is what we call it on the top. It's the, the, top it's part. the important part mm -hmm. and he gets that from mature, mature. wood mm -hmm. that and he, so he goes takes a piece of mature wood and uses it as a scion and grafts it onto his rootstock and that mature wood's already mature and it'll produce fruit real quick. Uh-huh. So the, it's already a grown-up. Even it's already, though it's little, it has all the characteristics. Everything has to grow up before they need yeah. to have babies. Okay. So he may <laughs> just have to wait. And Charles, I hope that when you do finally get some grapefruit that they'll be good because um, you just never know. It's kind of gambling, but there are people who do like to gamble. That's right. <laughs> um, one of the things that, um, that we enjoy doing is going around the state and finding about people who um, know different things. Dan McKenzie knows fruit, and we found someone down at Middleton Place who knows about how they used to do pottery in the old days. You're going to enjoy visiting with the potter in the Middleton Place courtyard. Oh, goodness. Um, a few little problems, maybe all that historical times we were in didn't want to be modern and media savvy. Um, you've got an interesting... Um, um, mystery. Uh, mystery. Another very, mystery. very interesting. Yes. Mystery is um, all over I'm the not place. so sure I'm going to taste this, but it's kind of funny looking. Well, this is going to be a, a different kind of a... Um, there, there we go. Nice. Look. A different kind of a mystery, and we'll just put it right here. Okay. I guess the uh, It looks like a string mop got... It looks Jar like uh, there's can. a mop in there. It does, a string or, mop. Um, and what I want kind to do is dirty open this up. Uh -huh. We'll turn it around and people can see the label. But this is a very unusual plant. It's called pacaya. Pacaya. And I'm going to open her up. So we had right. papaya and inside. now we got we pacaya. We had papaya oh, and now okay. we have, if I can open it up. Uh oh. <laughs> Uh, Might have to get Tony to Tony, give it a wrap. It. There we go. There you go. Okay. okay, so look at this. Now, wow. what we have here, okay. I'll put my glasses back on so I can see what's going on. You got the fork. Okay. Oh, shoot. You don't need a fork. You can just We reach don't need in. a fork. Reach in there and pull one of these oh, suckers Oh, my goodness. Out. It looks like an a octopus it or something. It looks like a sea animal, oh, doesn't Lord. it? Look at this thing. All and, connected um, together. Yeah, and uh, look how moppy looking it is. Oh, wow. It sure is. That is tentacly. And this what, is supposed to be eaten. It is supposed to be eaten, and it's actually quite a delicacy if oh. it's served the right way. <laughs> now, this is actually from a palm species. <gasps> really? A tropical palm. And uh -huh. so what these actually represent are the inflorescences of a tree when it's producing pollen. So this is like the stuff, our pine trees, the 
the, the worm-like things on them that are making everything so yellow right now. They're pretty close okay. to that. Uh -huh. And uh, of course the female flowers are somewhere else on the same palm yeah. tree. Now it's not a palm tree that grows in this area. This is a tropical species. Mm. And um, it's, <laughs> it's uh, called, again, it's called Pacaya uh -huh. palm. And um, it's grow it's all, like, yeah. it grows in Guatemala and uh -huh. uh, southern Mexico. And what, you, what uh, I understand this happens is you take one of these things uh -huh. and you, of course, you get to play with it for a while and yeah, try to can, scare yeah. the children. Yeah. Uh, but then you dip it into, <laughs> you dip it into egg batter. <laughs> and then you fry it up? And then you fry it, you make fritters out of it. Whoa, cool. And uh, the pictures just look wonderful. And yeah. I, I want to try okay. this stuff. But I also want to try this raw. And I will understand it, furthermore, it, it's different when it's raw. These things are, might be a little bit uh, bitter, but they're sometimes eaten in in salad. Now I want everybody uh -huh. to try one. Uh, Tony, you get to try one too. Uh -huh. And this is, it's in brine now. Mm -hmm. It's all right. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not so bad. It's, 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 <laughs> it's an acquired, it's an acquired taste. <laughs> it's a little bit. But you know, most things are better when they're fried, aren't they? That's squash? right. Yeah. Because right. you can fry daylily bud, or you can fry squash blossom. <laughs> you can put it in egg and fry it in bacon and then, grease. But, but, and then, Tony, you bought something that's from a palm that's in your yard. Mm -hmm. That's right. This is this is actually a windmill palm. Uh huh. The same thing mm -hmm. is to Let's get a good picture of that. Okay. Yeah, I can put it out front. Okay. Mm -hmm. Out here. With and that's a palm that does grow here in South Carolina. It's pretty hardy too. It's really oh, hardy. It's one of our hardiest palms. It's a, it's a good palm. This is actually again the the male flowers that mm -hmm. are producing on the palm. And uh, now I don't know about cooking this thing or anything. I've never palm. heard that uh, windmill have. palm flowers can be cooked, but um. Maybe we should try it. Well, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I'll try it. Watch okay. and see what happens. Yeah. I mean, this is the raw thing. This hasn't been, um, okay. has been, um, has it been brined? Mm -mm, or wash, but. Oh, wash him. We don't worry about that. It was up in the air. I think all your palms, though, most of them are. You know, yeah, they're edible know. in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. Not, I love the jelly palms. Yeah, the oh, jelly they're palms. wonderful. They're well, wonderful. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful food. Um, thank you, but lots of fun to look at. Maybe this is one that's better in a flower arrangement, or perhaps um, it could even ha one have a life for in a hat. hat. I that's think maybe it. that would be a better use for that. I think and so. I'm not going to make a hat out of this one. Um, I'll do a lot of Where's things, but water? I'm not making a hat. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, thank you, John. That was a lot of fun. Um, we are so disappointed that you couldn't see the segment of the potter, but don't be alarmed because we're going to show it in an upcoming week so you'll get to visit with the middle place um, the courtyard where the wonderful artisans are but right now Harvey has been very patiently waiting on the phone and he's over in Camden not too far away hey Harvey how are you and thank you for holding and waiting on us Harvey hello hey Harvey how are you Okay, how are you all? We're doing pretty good up here, except we've had, we would we would prefer a little. We, we're waiting for the ice cream. <laughs> this one, the, the, we think the ice yeah, cream is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> Can I we help? I wonder uh, see uh, if uh, I plant some cucumbers uh -huh. and some and some squash and stuff. And I was wondering if it was going to be uh, too cold for them to. Start growing, or will the cold kill them? Are they already up out of the ground, or are they just the seeds in the ground, Harvey? Uh, they're the seeds are in the ground. Oh, okay, okay. Tony, the seeds are in the ground. The ground's not gonna get that cold, is it? They'll be fine. Okay. It's just going down so quick. The ground's still warm. They'll come right up, hopefully, right after this cold snap, and then start to growing and be happy. Yeah, and you'll have things to eat that may be more um, palatable <laughs> than some of the things we've had to eat tonight. <laughs> but but we, th we like to know about new and different things. Okay, mm -hmm. Teresa, um, what's happening over there with you and your friends? Well, we've jumped from 25 people in the chat room to about 35 people in the chat room, and, and I don't think we're anywhere near capacity, so there's still plenty of time. Jump on in, join the conversation. Doesn't matter if you're an expert, you can ask a question, answer a question, or just read everything that's going on and absorb it all. We recently had a little discussion about um, phosphorus, and in certain states, uh, phosphorus is no longer found in complete fertilizers, the kind, the N, they have the N, 
and the P and the K. Um, so the middle number would be zero for no phosphorus. And that's because phosphorus contributes to algal blooms in waterways, and that can have some serious repercussions and even lead to fish kills. Um, so make sure you get your soil tested. You know, we're like broken records in the Extension Service. Don't guess soil test. Find out exactly what you need to make your plants happy. Amanda, back to you. Thank you very much. And um, Tony, I have a hat that I think would fit in in Lake City. What do you think? All right. They, yeah, they're famous for beans down there. It was the world, <laughs> world's largest bean market one time back many years ago. They used to ship them in, on train, in train cars all the way to New York. And John, we the venue for our upcoming event together. Again, I've had so much fun with you tonight. I'm glad it's going to be happening again on April the 26th. Our venue is the Bean Market. Bean Market? Yeah. No, I've never been there. What? I have to admit well, it. Well, it is beautiful, it. and there's room for about 300 people, and we want to have a full house. So come down and enjoy the magic of Art Fields. What a 10-day extravaganza. Um, you can find out all about it. I've been looking and planning my days down there. I'm going to have a great time, and you will too. And we will be so excited if you will especially be there on the 26th of April and join us at the Bean Market. I was thinking you say Vinorama, and I can say Beanie Weenie. Beanie Weenie. Beanie Weenie. <laughs> and, um, and, um, and so please make plans to be with us there. We've got another caller who's been so nice about waiting, a caller from Dallas, Dallas, North Carolina, and that's Gail. Gail, how can we help you? Hey, how y'all doing? We're having fun tonight. Thank you for calling us. Good. You're welcome. Uh, I have a big hydrangea. Uh-huh. And uh, it didn't do good last year. Was it because of all the rain we had? It, it just started coming out, and it looked pretty good. And I didn't know if I need to feed it or leave it alone or, or what. Is it one of the mop head ones, the, the ones that have the big flowers on them that are pink and blue and... Yeah, this one's kind of bluish, lavenderish. Okay. And has it done well for you in the past, Gail? Well, it 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 tried to bloom last year. I got two, oh like two mm -hmm. not good sized ones, like you're supposed to. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? They yeah. they didn't bloom all the way out. And you haven't pruned it severely or done anything like that. Have well, you... uh, I cut it back year before last, and oh. it, it came up. It, it yeah. came back full, but it didn't, yeah. it didn't okay. come up to balls like they're supposed yeah. to. Tony, I think her problem was the pruning, don't you? I think it was. Or, or, because if you prune too late, they actually, they produce flowers on, on old last year's wood. wood. On so, last year's wood. So if you cut that off, you lose your flowers. So, so it's better not to even prune them. Better not to even prune them unless you've got a real old stem or something like that. And last like that. year it rained so much we had a lot of the leaf spot right. on them. They was really it was tough It was a on tough them. year. I hope it'll be a better year and that you will have, we will all have prettiest hydrangeas. Um, I want to thank our dynamic brunette duo <laughs> who came on the show and I hope this is the first of many such appearances and um, because we can't wait to come over and visit y'all with our spoons in hand gals thank you again and thank and um, I think y'all go tell us how to get these recipes we yeah. are um, they're both going to be posted on um, I think uh, making it gross Facebook page mm -hmm. and then also Earth Fairs um, Facebook page yes we are going to put both recipes for the strawberry ice cream and the um, summer fruit salsa on Earth Fair Columbia that's on Facebook again our page is Earth Fair Columbia we'll give you step-by-step -step instructions we'll have photographs extremely easy to follow and uh, you can also give us a call at 803-799-0048 we'll be more than happy to walk you through the recipes so thank Thank you so much for having us, and I hope you enjoy, and I know I'm going to be making that strawberry ice cream very soon. I'm going to be eating what we have yes. here. <laughs> and I'm not sharing. Nope. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> All right. Back to you, Amanda. Okay. Thank you so much. much. And um, we want to remind people that um, South Carolina farmers have local strawberries coming in. Tony has worked with many of them. Gilbert Pop Powell um, has worked with so many of them, and we want to thank all the extension people and the, and the growers in the state who bring this delicious, fresh, tasty treat to us. Um, it tastes a lot better than the ones that get shipped in. And now I want to thank Teresa for all that she does with us and for being with us tonight. Teresa? It's always my pleasure. Time flies when you're having fun, so it always flies in the chat room. Great conversation, and if you didn't have a chance, you can always join us all week on our Facebook page. Amanda, back to you. 
Thank you so much. And John, you are so nice about helping people identify plants. And if they want to send you some pictures by the email or whatever, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Well, <clears throat> um, by as you say, by email, if someone wants to make an attachment of a of a JPEG image, just send it right along. And usually those are perfectly adequate for identification. Or you could bring it by the office if you can find a parking, parking place. <laughs> or just call me up and then we can make an arrangement. Okay, great. And um, are you going to have some fun plants down at Earth? I mean, when we go down to um, the bean market on April the 26th, uh -huh. are you and Vicki going to have some fun things for us? Well, I think that uh, Vicki and I will have to talk about uh, all a big assortment of interesting things. Ooh. To well, if show you can't off. find things in that part of the world with all the fabulous soils that are there, um, and we want to thank you so much for taking time out of tromping all over those hundreds of thousands of acres you're overlooking all the time. <laughs> Tony, you just look over everybody in the world, I, and we thank you for looking over us and all of our problems and visitors tonight. I love getting out and working with folks, Samantha. And um, it's not going to be very far for you to drive down there and be with us on April the 26th, is it? I'm looking forward to it, really. Yeah. really am. All, all the Bing Museum's a beautiful place. Oh, it's going to be so much fun, and we want you to be part of the fun and join us. Join us for the art field activities, go around and look in all the stores, see the art, and then come and be with us on April the 26th. Making It Grow is brought to you in part by Santee Cooper, South Carolina's state-owned electric and water utility. More information on green power and energy conservation programs online at SanteeCooper.com. The South Carolina Department of Agriculture, reminding you that certified South Carolina agricultural products help make South Carolina grow. McLeod Farms in Macby, South Carolina. This family farm offers seasonal produce, including over 22 varieties of peaches. Glory Foods, celebrating Southern food with a soulful heritage. Glory Foods, a way of inviting South Carolina back to the dinner table. FTC Diversified, a proud part of your local communities, providing communication, entertainment, and security. Art Fields, a 10-day art competition in Lake City, South Carolina. Additional funding provided by International Paper.